Chapter Two, Part One of the Eight Strokes of the Clock. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lenny. The Eight Strokes of the Clock by Maurice Leblanc. Chapter Two, Part One. The Water Bottle. Four days after she had settled down in Paris, Hortense Daniel agreed to meet Prince Renin in the Bois. It was a glorious morning, and they sat down on the terrace of the Restaurant Imperial, a little to one side. Hortense, feeling glad to be alive, was in a playful mood, full of attractive grace. Renin, lest he should startle her, refrained from alluding to the compact into which they had entered at his suggestion. She told him how she had left La Marraise, and said that she had not heard of Rossigny. "'I have,' said Renin. I've heard of him. Oh? Yes. He sent me a challenge. We fought a duel this morning. Rossigny got a scratch in the shoulder. That finished the duel. Let's talk of something else. There was no further mention of Rossigny. Henin at once expounded to Hortense the plan of two enterprises which he had in view, and which he offered, with no great enthusiasm, to let her share. The finest adventure, he declared, is that which we do not foresee. It comes unexpectedly, unannounced, and no one, save the initiated, realizes that an opportunity to act and to expend one's energies is close at hand. It has to be seized at once. A moment's hesitation may mean that we are too late. We are warned by a special sense, like that of a sleuth hound which distinguishes the right scent from all the others that cross it. The terrace was beginning to fill up around them. At the next table sat a young man, reading a newspaper. They were able to see his insignificant profile and his long, dark moustache. From behind them, through an open window of the restaurant, came the distant strains of a band. In one of the rooms, a few couples were dancing. As Henin was paying for the refreshments, the young man, with the long moustache, stifled a cry, and, in a choking voice, called one of the waiters. "'What do I owe you? No change? Oh, good Lord, hurry up!' Henin, without a moment's hesitation, had picked up the paper. After casting a swift glance down the page, he read, under his breath, "'Maître Dourdan, the counsel for the defense in the trial of Jacques Aubrier, has been received at the Élysée. We are informed that the President of the Republic has refused to reprieve the condemned man, and that the execution will take place tomorrow morning. After crossing the terrace, the young man found himself faced, at the entrance to the garden, by a lady and a gentleman, who blocked his way. And the latter said, Excuse me, sir, but I noticed your agitation. It's about Jacques Aubrier, isn't it? Yes, yes, Jacques Aubrier, the young man stammered. Jacques, the friend of my childhood. I'm hurrying to see his wife. She must be beside herself with grief. Can I offer you my assistance? I am Prince Renin. This lady and I would be happy to call on Madame Aubrier and to place our services at her disposal. The young man, upset by the news which he had read, seemed not to understand. He introduced himself awkwardly. My name is Dutruy, Gaston Dutruy. Henin beckoned to his chauffeur, who was waiting at some little distance, and pushed Gaston Dutruy into the car, asking, What address? Where does Madame Aubrier live? 23 Bess, Avenue du Roule. After helping Hortense in, Henin repeated the address to the chauffeur, and, as soon as they drove off, tried to question Gaston Dutruy. I know very little of the case, he said. Tell it to me as briefly as you can. Jacques Aubrier killed one of his near relations, didn't he? He's innocent, sir, replied the young man, who seemed incapable of giving the least explanation. Innocent, I swear it. I've been Jacques's friend for twenty years. He's innocent, and it would be monstrous. There was nothing to be got out of him. Besides... It was only a short drive. 
they entered Neuilly through the Porte de Sablon, and two minutes later stopped before a long, narrow passage between high walls which led them to a small, one-storied house. Gaston Dutreuil rang. Madame is in the drawing-room, with her mother, said the maid who opened the door. I'll go in to the ladies, he said, taking Henin and Hortense with him. It was a fair-sized, prettily furnished room, which, in ordinary times, must have been used also as a study. Two women sat weeping, one of whom, elderly and grey-haired, came up to Gaston Dutreuil. He explained the reason for Henin's presence, and she at once cried amid her sobs. "'My daughter's husband is innocent, sir. Jacques! A better man never lived. He was so good-hearted. Murder his cousin. But he worshipped his cousin. I swear that he's not guilty, sir. And they are going to commit the infamy of putting him to death. Oh, sir, it will kill my daughter.' Henin realized that all these people had been living for months under the obsession of that innocence, and in the certainty that an innocent man could never be executed. The news of the execution, which was now inevitable, was driving them mad. He went up to a poor creature, bent in two, whose face, a quite young face, framed in pretty flaxen hair, was convulsed with desperate grief. Hortense, who had already taken a seat beside her, gently drew her head against her shoulder. Henin said to her, Madame, I do not know what I can do for you, but I give you my word of honor that, if any one in this world can be of use to you, it is myself. I therefore implore you to answer my questions as though the clear and definite wording of your replies were able to alter the aspect of things, and as though you wished to make me share your opinion of Jacques Aubrier for he is innocent, is he not? Oh, sir, indeed he is, she exclaimed, and the woman's whole soul was in the words. You are certain of it, but you were unable to communicate your certainty to the court. Well, you must now compel me to share it. I am not asking you to go into details, and to live again through the hideous torment which you have suffered, but merely to answer certain questions. Will you do this? How will? Henin's influence over her was complete. With a few sentences, Henin had succeeded in subduing her and inspiring her with the will to obey. And once more, Hortense realized all the man's power, authority, and persuasion. "'What was your husband?' he asked, after begging the mother and Gaston Dutreuil to preserve absolute silence. "'An insurance broker. Lucky in business? Until last year, yes.' So there have been financial difficulties during the past few months? Yes. And the murder was committed when? Last March, on a Sunday. Who was the victim? A distant cousin, Monsieur Guillaume, who lived at Suresne. What was the sum stolen? Sixty thousand franc notes, which this cousin had received the day before, in payment of a long outstanding debt. Did your husband know that? Yes, his cousin told him of it on the Sunday in the course of a conversation on the telephone, and Jacques insisted that his cousin ought not to keep so large a sum in the house, and that he ought to pay it into a bank next day. Was this in the morning? At one o'clock in the afternoon. Jacques was to have gone to Monsieur Guillaume on his motorcycle, but he felt tired, and told him that he would not go out, so he remained here all day. Alone? Yes. The two servants were out. I went to the Cinéma des Ternes, with my mother and our friend Dutreuil. In the evening we learned that Monsieur Guillaume had been murdered. Next morning Jacques was arrested. On what evidence? The poor creature hesitated to reply. The evidence of guilt had evidently been overwhelming. Then, obeying a sign from Renin, she answered without a pause. The murderer went to Suresne on a motorcycle, and the tracks discovered were those of my husband's machine. They found a handkerchief with my husband's initials and the revolver which was used belonged to him. Lastly, one of our neighbors maintains that he saw my husband go out on his bicycle at three o'clock, and another that he saw him come in at half-past four. The murder was committed at four o'clock. And what does Jacques Aubrieux say in his defense? He declares that he slept all the afternoon. During that time, someone came, who managed to unlock the cycle shed and take the motorcycle to go to Suresne. 
As for the handkerchief and the revolver, they were in the tool-bag. There would be nothing surprising in the murderers using them. It seems a plausible explanation. Yes, but the prosecution raised two objections. In the first place, nobody, absolutely nobody, knew that my husband was going to stay at home all day, because, on the contrary, it was his habit to go out on his motorcycle every Sunday afternoon. And the second objection? She flushed and murmured. The murderer went to the pantry at Monsieur Guillaume's and drank half a bottle of wine straight out of the bottle, which shows my husband's fingerprints. It seemed as though her strength was exhausted, and as though, at the same time, the unconscious hope which Henin's intervention had awakened in her had suddenly vanished before the accumulation of adverse facts. Again she collapsed, withdrawn into a sort of silent meditation, from which Hortense's affectionate attentions were unable to distract her. The mother stammered, "'He's not guilty, is he, sir? And they can't punish an innocent man. They haven't the right to kill my daughter. Oh, dear, oh, dear, what have we done to be tortured like this? My poor little Madeleine!' "'She will kill herself,' said Dutreuil, in a scared voice. "'She will never be able to endure the idea that they are guillotining Jacques.' She will kill herself presently, this very night. Henin was striding up and down the room. "'You can do nothing for her, can you?' asked Hortense. "'It's half-past eleven now,' he replied, in an anxious tone. "'And it's to happen to-morrow morning. "'Do you think he's guilty? "'I don't know, I don't know. "'The poor woman's conviction is too impressive to be neglected.' When two people have lived together for years, they can hardly be mistaken about each other to that degree, and yet. He stretched himself out on a sofa and lit a cigarette. He smoked three in succession, without a word from anyone to interrupt his train of thought. From time to time he looked at his watch. Every minute was of such importance. At last he went back to Madeleine Aubrieux, took her hands and said, very gently, you must not kill yourself. There is hope left until the last minute has come. And I promise you that, for my part, I will not be disheartened until that last minute. But I need your calmness and your confidence. I will be calm, she said, with a pitiable air. And confident? And confident. Well, wait for me. I shall be back in two hours from now. Will you come with us, Monsieur Dutreuil? As they were stepping into his car, he asked the young man, "'Do you know any small, unfrequented restaurant not too far inside Paris?' "'There's the Brasserie Lutetia, on the ground floor of the house in which I live, on the Place de Terne. "'Capital. That will be very handy.' They scarcely spoke on the way. Renin, however, said to Gaston Dutreuil, "'So far as I remember, the numbers of the notes are known, aren't they? Yes, Monsieur Guillaume had entered the sixty numbers in his pocket-book. Henid muttered a moment later, That's where the whole problem lies. Where are the notes? If we could lay our hands on them, we should know everything. At the Brasserie Lutetia, there was a telephone in the private room where he asked to have lunch served. When the waiter had left him alone with Hortense and Dutreuil, he took down the receiver with a resolute air. Hello? Prefecture of Police, please. Hello? Hello? Is that the Prefecture of Police? Please put me on to the Criminal Investigation Department. I have a very important communication to make. You can say it's Prince Henin. Holding the receiver in his hand, he turned to Gaston Dutreuil. I can ask someone to come here, I suppose. We shall be quite undisturbed. Quite. He listened again. The secretary to the head of the criminal investigation department? Oh, excellent. Mr. Secretary, I have on several occasions been in communication with Monsieur Dudui, and have given him information which has been of great use to him. He is sure to remember Prince Henin. I may be able today to show him where the sixty thousand franc notes are hidden, which Aubrieux, the murderer, stole from his cousin. If he is interested in the proposal, beg him to send an inspector to Brasserie Lutetia, Place de Terne. I shall be there with a lady, and Monsieur Dutreuil, Aubrieux's friend. Good day, Mr. Secretary. 
when henin hung up the instrument he saw the amazed faces of hortense and of gaston dutruy confronting him hortense whispered then you know you've discovered nothing he said laughing well well i'm acting as though i knew it's not a bad method let's have some lunch shall we the clock marked a quarter to one the men from the prefecture will be here he said in twenty minutes at latest and if no one comes hortense objected that would surprise me of course if i had sent a message to monsieur dujuy saying aubrieux is innocent i should have failed to make any impression it's not the least use on the eve of an execution to attempt to convince the gentry of the police or of the law that a man condemned to death is innocent no from henceforth jacques aubrieux belongs to the executioner but the prospect of securing the sixty banknotes is a windfall worth taking a little trouble over just think that was the weak point in the indictment those sixty notes which they were unable to trace but as you know nothing of their whereabouts my dear girl i hope you don't mind my calling you so my dear girl when a man can't explain this or that physical phenomenon he adopts some sort of theory which explains the various manifestations of the phenomenon and says that everything happened as though the theory were correct that's what i'm doing that amounts to saying that you are going upon a supposition henin did not reply not until some time later when lunch was over did he say obviously i am going upon a supposition if i had several days before me i should take the trouble of first verifying my theory which is based upon intuition quite as much as upon a few scattered facts but i only have two hours and i am embarking on the unknown path as though i were certain that it would lead me to the truth and suppose you are wrong i have no choice besides it is too late there's a knock oh one word more whatever i may say don't contradict me nor you monsieur dutruy he opened the door a thin man with a red imperial entered prince renin yes sir you of course are from Monsieur Dujuy? Yes. And the newcomer gave his name. Chief Inspector Morisseau. I am obliged to you for coming so promptly, Mr. Chief Inspector, said Prince Renin. And I hope that Monsieur Dujuy will not regret having placed you at my disposal. At your entire disposal, in addition to two inspectors whom I have left in the square outside, and who have been in the case with me from the first. I shall not detain you for any length of time said henin and i will not even ask you to sit down we have only a few minutes in which to settle everything you know what it's all about the sixty thousand franc notes stolen from monsieur guillaume i have the numbers here henin ran his eyes down the slip of paper which the chief inspector handed him and said that's right the true lists agree inspector morisseau seemed greatly excited the chief attaches the greatest importance to your discovery, so you will be able to show me? Henin was silent for a moment, and then declared, Mr. Chief Inspector, a personal investigation, and a most exhaustive investigation it was, as I will explain to you presently, has revealed the fact that, on his return from Souresne, the murderer, after replacing the motorcycle in the shed in the Avenue du Paul, ran to the Terne and entered this house, this house yes but what did he come here for to hide the proceeds of his theft the sixty banknotes how do you mean where in a flat of which he had the key on the fifth floor gaston dutruy exclaimed in amazement but there's only one flat on the fifth floor and that's the one i live in exactly and as you were at the cinema with madame aubrieu and her mother advantage was taken of your absence impossible no one has the key except myself one can get in without a key but i have seen no marks of any kind morisseau intervened come let us understand one another you say the banknotes were hidden in monsieur dutruy's flat yes then as jacques aubrieux was arrested the next morning the notes ought to be there still that's my opinion gaston dutruy could not help laughing but that's absurd I should have found them. Did you look for them? No, but I should have come across them at any moment. The place isn't big enough to swing a cat in, 
Would you care to see it? However small it may be, it's large enough to hold sixty bits of paper. Of course everything's possible, said Dutrui. Still, I must repeat that nobody, to my knowledge, has been to my rooms, that there is only one key, that I am my own housekeeper, and that I can't quite understand. Hortense, too, could not understand. With her eyes fixed on Prince Renin's, she was trying to read his innermost thoughts. What game was he playing? Was it her duty to support his statements? She ended by saying, Mr. Chief Inspector, since Prince Henin maintains that the notes have been put away upstairs, wouldn't the simplest thing be to go and look? Monsieur Dutrui will take us up, won't you? This minute, said the young man, as you say, that will be simplest. They all four climbed the five stories of the house, and, after Dutrui had opened the door, entered a tiny set of chambers, consisting of a sitting-room, bedroom, kitchen, and bathroom, all arranged with fastidious neatness. It was easy to see that every chair in the sitting-room occupied a definite place. The pipes had a rack to themselves, so had the matches. Three walking-sticks, arranged according to their length, hung from three nails. On a little table before the window, a hat-box, filled with tissue paper, awaited the felt hat which Dutrui carefully placed in it. He laid his gloves beside it on the lid. He did all this with sedate and mechanical movements, like a man who loves to see things in the places which he has chosen for them. Indeed, no sooner did Renin shift something than Dutrui made a slight gesture of protest, took out his hat again, stuck it on his head, opened the window and rested his elbows on the sill, with his back turned to the room, as though he were unable to bear the sight of such vandalism. "'You're positive, are you not?' the inspector asked Henin. "'Yes, yes, I'm positive that the sixty notes were brought here after the murder. Let's look for them.' This was easy and soon done. In half an hour not a corner remained unexplored, not a knick-knack unlifted. Nothing, said Inspector Morisot. Shall we continue? No, replied Renin. The notes are no longer here. What do you mean? I mean that they have been removed. By whom? Can't you make a more definite accusation? Renin did not reply. But Gaston Dutrui wheeled round. He was choking and spluttered. Mr. Inspector, would you like me to make the accusation more definite, as conveyed by this gentleman's remarks? It all means that there's a dishonest man here, that the notes hidden by the murderer were discovered and stolen by that dishonest man, and deposited in another and safe place. That is your idea, sir, is it not? And you accuse me of committing this theft, don't you? He came forward, drumming his chest with his fists. Me! Me! I found the notes, did I, and kept them for myself? You dare to suggest that? Henin still made no reply. Dutrui flew into a rage, and taking Inspector Morisot aside, exclaimed, Mr. Inspector, I strongly protest against all this farce, and against the part which you are unconsciously playing in it. Before your arrival, Prince Henin told this lady and myself that he knew nothing, that he was venturing into this affair at random, and that he was following the first row that offered, trusting to luck. Do you deny it, sir? Henin did not open his lips. Answer me, will you? Explain yourself. For, really, you are putting forward the most improbable facts without any proof whatever. It's easy enough to say that I stole the notes. And how were you to know that they were here at all? Who brought them here? Why should the murderer choose this flat to hide them in? It's all so stupid, so illogical and absurd. Give us your proof, sir, one single proof. Inspector Morisot seemed perplexed. He questioned Renin with a glance. Renin said, Since you want specific details, we will get them from Madame Aubrieux herself. She's on the telephone. Let's go downstairs. We shall know all about it in a minute. Dutrui shrugged his shoulders. As you please, but what a waste of time! He seemed greatly irritated. His long wait at the window, under a blazing sun, had thrown him into a sweat. 
he went to his bedroom and returned with a bottle of water, of which he took a few sips, afterwards placing the bottle on the window sill. Come along, he said. Prince Rénine chuckled. You seem to be in a hurry to leave the place. I'm in a hurry to show you up, retorted Dutrilly, slamming the door. End of chapter 2, part 1